Hello, friends. Welcome to another Blazor Power Hour, the show where we explore some Blazor feature for at least an hour. We've been working on a project for the last couple of weeks, actually. Um, and that one I finished up um, in the office here just earlier this week. I'm getting ready to push that up to GitHub. So I was working on the uh, Blazing Pizza app, trying to help the folks over at Microsoft get this ready for .NET 8. So uh, the Blazing Pizza Workshop, I've gone through an added nullability uh, context to the whole thing. Get a screen share up and running here. And uh, it's I'm getting ready to submit a pull request, probably later today. Still working on a couple bugs with um, the PWA, progressive web app stuff, not quite working right. And I'm not sure if it's a change that I made or if it's just uh, the behavior of progressive web apps um, while you're debugging. It's just kind of um, not very stable. Hello, folks. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm working on, on that PWA step. I don't know if anybody's built the the uh, blazing pizza workshop before but that that final step there with the push notifications can be tricky not quite sure what's happening so uh, rather than troubleshoot that live here and i think it's it's probably just a browser thing more than anything i'm going to finish that up submit a pull request for this and then um, maybe in a week or two we'll look at um, how we might migrate this to dotnet 8 uh, and before we can do that, we need to learn a little bit more about what's happened in .NET 8. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at some of the project templates that are coming with .NET 8 for Blazor because there's a lot of big changes in there. So the first thing I'm going to do is pull up my Visual Studio preview, which I reinstalled if um, you weren't part of the show a couple weeks ago. I had to uninstall this. Um, actually it wasn't a show, it was a uh, webinar that I gave. Um, we did a workshop on migrating from web forms to Blazor on .NET 7. And when I installed Visual Studio Preview with .NET 8, it broke my, it broke my apps. So side-by-side -side installation is tricky. Um, they still haven't worked out all the bugs with it. Uh, Buyer beware on installing preview bits. It may break things that are stable and working in .NET 7. So let's go ahead and launch the preview now that I've got it installed back on my machine. And as you can see, we've been working on the Blazing Pizza and then I've got all these Blazor apps that I've created. That's because I've been testing out these new templates and there's a lot to talk about here. Um, Let's go ahead and just jump into the new project dialog and see what we've got. Uh, so these are the old templates. These are the old templates right here. There we go. Get the right zoom tool locked in. Uh, the Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly app are the old templates. Um, I, I still need to see if these are going to stick around, um, but I know... We've got a brand new Blazor template that is shipping in .NET 8, and this is where all the action is happening. Um, lots of big changes here. So let's just get into the dialogue and we'll, we'll be able to see what some of the issues are, not issues, but some of the talking points are. Um, oh, I clicked through create the mouse or the screen lagged a little bit there. I didn't mean to go that fast. I definitely want to go back and look at that screen one more time because I want to talk about what's on it. So do a new Blazor web app next. There we go. Pause right there. The key word in .NET 8 is going to be interactivity. So is my Blazor app interactive? And if it is, is it interactive on the web or is it interactive on the server? So the main idea here is to get away from the idea that Blazor is either server-side or client-side with WebAssembly. 
and laser is just laser and it's just this united thing that we can use and we can pick and choose when we want things to render interactive interactively <laughs> on the server or interactively on the client with that interactive bit uh, comes the idea that we may not want interactivity at all we might just want to render pages using the blazer component model so if i took that off we'll put the sample page back on there i could choose to not have interactivity at all now another thing that i find interesting about this approach is um, we're not talking about running blazer without a dotnet server which uh, we had some conversations around in previous versions of blazer um, I don't know. I, I need to talk to Daniel Roth and see if um, it's just not how people are using Blazor. They're not using, you know, they're not using Blazor WebAssembly with uh, third-party non.NET backends. Maybe that's part of the reason for this. But um, the main use case for Blazor looks like it is for .NET developers that are already using a Blazor, or sorry, a .NET server on the back end for something. And with that assumption made, um, the idea is we can just render components, uh, Blazor components directly with that .NET server, serve those up, and they don't necessarily need to be interactive at all. Uh, the nice part about this is if you're rendering components out and they're not interactive, that means there's less overhead as far as uh, what's delivered to the browser. We, maybe we don't need WebAssembly delivered to the browser. Uh, that means the .NET runtime is not shipped down and uh, that, that saves us some loading time. Um, if we're talking about the server, that means there's web sockets that don't need to be opened or may able, be able to be closed. Um, if we're not rendering components that are in, interactive and, uh, to make this even, um, a, a better, uh, type of a scenario, we could have a page that loads, that's not interactive, navigate to another page that maybe just has a single component on it that is interactive and it could choose automatically whether it wants to use WebAssembly or the server uh, WebSocket to be interactive. The, the benefit there being the load time of the page will be very quick. Uh, we're only talking about delivering HTML and maybe a little bit of JavaScript uh, and then in the background, download the .NET runtime in WebAssembly, and the next time we visit that page, it's ready to go and interactive on the client without any server help at all. So the templates have changed to reflect this new uh, world that we're gonna be in in .NET 8, and it leaves us with a lot of possibilities for our Blazor apps, and I think it's really cool. Um, I, I think it fits the persona of people that are building Blazor applications. I think they're, they're definitely .NET developers. I don't see a lot of people flocking from uh, their beloved JavaScript frameworks to come over to .NET just to write Blazor apps. So I, I don't think your, your node backend engineer is gonna be you know, jumping on this. So I think the decision to go with this um, approach of the static .NET uh, uh, rendered pages and then add interactivity um, is a nice approach. And it's, it's kind of that um, progressive enhancement type of aspect that we've, you know, enjoyed with the web for quite some time. And it's just being applied in that .NET Blazor context now. So let's try the template with just the use interactive server components and see what we get. Mind you, this is in preview. They are still making changes. You will see weird things commented in some of the components in some cases where it's like, this isn't the way it's going to ship. This is just a placeholder for something that we're still working on. So keep that in mind.
And so we've nude that up. Uh, this is with the server interactive components. Now, we zoom in over on our solution explorer. Some things look similar, but we've got some differences. Uh, one of those being this top level components folder. Uh, this is just some reorganization of what we used to have with pages and shared. Now, um, the shared folder is gone. I like that. The shared folder was the catch-all junk drawer of components. Um, now that catch-all junk drawer may just end up being here, but at least it's not an opinion that was expressed by uh, the Blazor team to, to just throw everything in that junk drawer. Uh, they do have the appropriately named layout folder now. And this is one change that I usually made to my apps when I was writing a Blazor application is I would immediately create a layout folder and move my layouts in there. And then I would break off um, this pages folder into features. And then uh, that would be basically my top level. Um, I do think pages is still good because people relate the routing that is in these components to pages. But uh, for me, this was a feature folder. All right, some other changes here. A little bit of uh, naming conventions. Um, we used to have the fetch data, um, fetch data page. Now it's the weather page. Uh, that's what, you know, that's the demo that's on that page. So uh, rather than just calling it fetch data, they call it weather. Uh, so that's a change. I think we saw this change a couple times throughout the .NET uh, 8 um, preview history as well. So I think it went from fetch data to uh, something else data related. Um, and now, now it's just weather. Um, another thing that's changed here, you'll notice we don't have um, a uh, HTML page. This is server Blazor, what would essentially have been Blazor server. Uh, but we also don't have under pages that hosts HT, CS HTML file, just not there. And uh, the reason for that is we can now render uh, Razor components statically. So we don't need the, um, the older CS HTML format. So now that we can render these uh, components directly and not interact, not have interactivity, uh, you will see that the app.razor file is where the hosts CSHTML or the um, index.razor went. So this, this is your new, new home page here or your new root uh, page here. So host CS HTML and index HTML. This is now replacing um, those with app.razor. And inside of this, things will look somewhat familiar again with some changes. Um, we have uh, the head of the document here and a head outlet. This is something that came in .NET 7. Um, this is a way of interacting with this head element of the page and uh, lets you add things like metadata and change the page title, stuff like that. Uh, routes is new in .NET 8. Okay, this is new in .NET 8. Um, and this has to do with the ability to render this component statically and uh, help with the, the application be able to uh, start up the router. And the router used to be part of um, the, uh, what's it called? Used to be uh, part of the app, I guess. It, you would find this um, inside of uh, the other part of the application. Now um, it's kind of separated out into this routes.razor file. Um, and uh, this helps facilitate this whole, uh, you know, united effort and uh, let you run either on WebAssembly or on, um, on the server and, and also statically render. So these things got separated out to facilitate that. So um, 
let's take a look here at one of the pages and we'll, we'll see some more differences. So the application itself, again, it's rendering statically, but this counter component is saying to go ahead and render in a uh, server side interactive mode. So it has the attribute up here to render mode server. Uh, if we go down to the home page here, there's no interactivity on this page. So we don't have uh, a render mode here. And the weather page is also running with server rendering, but it, all, it has something um, that's going to help with any long running tasks. And this is called stream rendering. And if you enable stream rendering on a page, it will render server side um, and any long running tasks, it will br be brought in as they get awaited. So it will actually render the page. Um, it will try to render the weather forecast page here, but uh, the data won't be ready yet. So we'll get the loading um, message here. It will render very quickly, but it'll render the loading message. And then when the task completes, it will uh, patch in the rest of the table here. Let's go ahead and run this, take a look, see what we've got. And then we'll try some of the other uh, templates that we have. There was some other housekeeping things that I didn't get to mention yet. Um, they ditched um, some of the bootstrap icons. There's um, just a few icons that are included with the, uh, sorry, it was open iconic, not bootstrap icons. But um, there's a couple icons that are just included to make the template look nice, and that's it. Um, it still uses Bootstrap. Um, I need to take a look here in a minute and see which version. I just know it's Bootstrap at the moment. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this looks a lot like the Blazor template that we know and love already. But um, there's just some uh, major design decisions that got changed underneath the hood. So we've got our homepage again. There's nothing interactive here. Um, let's see. In this version, I believe there's still, let's try pulling up um, the network resource tab here and see if we get WebSocket connections. Uh, I think there's a WebSocket connection at the moment um for for this page let's see if we can get that to show up I'm trying to find which part of this is actually the web socket coming through let's try the counter component see if we can find it here because it may actually not be there um ah here we go it's under the messages tab it's under the wrong tab i had the right thing but not the right tab so if we go back home let's try this again empty cache hard reload i think there's still currently a websocket connection here yeah and it's still you can see it keeping alive um in future versions of blazor or in future versions of dotnet 8 uh when this gets closer to release i believe this connection will no longer be here uh because the render mode uh, it's set on the counter, but not on the home page. And the WebSocket connection is still here listening. So I, I believe this is going to go away um, in the next release cycle to where if that attribute is missing, like it is here on the home page, uh, then you won't see this WebSocket traffic at all. all right. So let's, let's try something really quick. You saw that the counter component was actually working correctly. Let's remove this attribute and see what happens. So we rem remove the render server attribute. If we go back, it still looks like the counter component, everything rendered. Again, remember it's rendering server side statically right now. And if I click here, you can see that there's no interactivity. So that interactivity did get turned off. But again, because this is in a preview state, not everything is quite 100% yet. But uh, this, this WebSocket, you can see, is still listening, even though it's not really actively doing anything.
All right. So that's the the server template with the render server mode attribute applied. Uh, let's take a look here under Bootstrap strap real quick. Uh, let's see if they left. Okay, so this is running Bootstrap 5.1.0. And looks like we're just a minor version behind. Um, I think Bootstrap 6 is in the works. But uh, let's see if it's on here anywhere. Uh, I don't I'm trying to remember where the roadmap is for Bootstrap. I haven't looked at it in a while. I believe .NET, or, uh, Bootstrap 6 is in the works, though. So we're, we're on pretty much, give or take a minor version, the latest version of Bootstrap, which is nice. I don't, I don't mind Bootstrap so much. Um, I'm glad they didn't make the choice to put something heavy in here like Tailwind. If you want to bring in Tailwind, you can. Wouldn't be my first choice, but some people really like it. Um, hey, Smab, welcome. Um, so if you're just joining us, we're taking a tour of the .NET 8 uh, Blazor templates and in, in the major changes that are coming with them. It's quite, quite a sweeping amount of changes actually a um, lot of lot of different things going on here in the way the apps are structured uh, we also have in here um, the server render mode is set uh, in the um, the program settings so you'll see this uh, change as well depending on um, the uh, type of template that we we use. I believe this will have a couple different choices in here. Uh, let's see, we have add render mode and add server render mode. This may just be the static rendering. I have to double check on that one. If you moved a couple already, wow. You're head of the games, Mab. Look at that. Um, and and you already know them pretty well. Well, maybe you can help me along the way if I get stuck. Uh, I've checked them out very briefly, briefly, but I haven't really moved any projects over. And uh, that was some of my comments at the opening of the show is I worked on the Blazing Pizza app, uh, getting it up to proper .NET 7 with uh, nullable context. And then... Uh, maybe next week uh, we'll we'll move that over to .NET 8. Um, hopefully that pull request gets uh, submitted by me and pulled in uh, by Daniel pretty soon, so we can have that done. All right, so this is the gist of the the um, server template. Let's take a look at the WebAssembly template. We do the same thing. This one's going to be a different approach here um, because we turn off interactive server components and turn on WebAssembly components and hit create. Initially, what I, I kind of expected here uh, was the classic uh, web only or, or uh, front end only um, template. And it's not that. So we've got, um, let's see, that's weird. It named it Blazor App 1 and 6. Let's try doing this again. Let's pick a new folder this time. So project name and solution name, is that where it got that from? Let's, let's just make a new folder. And hit create here. Don't save that. Don't care about that thing. All right, that that's better. Everything is Blazor app one client one. Um, you should leave them on both. Really, uh, yeah, we're kind of exploring each one um, independently to see what the differences are, and then we'll do the the both of them last, and look at what we get with that. And yeah, I agree. The auto render mode is the the coolest part of all of this, and I think will be very um, very helpful 
uh, to say the least. It will be the way to build uh, your Blazor apps in the future. So we've got two projects in this one, and this caught me off guard at first because I wasn't really thinking in the context of um, the server renders everything and uh, this, this static um, server rendering aspect of .NET 8. So we have two projects now. I was expecting just this one and uh, finding the CS or the index HTML file, all of that. Um, now we have uh, a server app um, instead. Again, the, the expectations here are that um, the server will statically render everything. And, uh, you know, most use cases for Blazor, I think, is there's a .NET server. I, I don't think a lot of people are doing the static uh, Blazor website with no server type of a thing. Um, there may be a few of you out there. And uh, I've built some examples and things where it's just a, a static web application. But in reality, you, you have to have some kind of data coming from somewhere. Um, and I think if you're writing a .NET front end, that data is likely coming from a .NET backend. So I think that's where this whole idea is coming from. So we can render Blazor statically from the server. We have our Blazor server to do that now, or there, our ASP.NET server to do that now. Uh, we have our layout, our pages, uh, and then we have a counter page um, here. So I wonder if there will be some uh, changes coming to this uh, in the near future. Um, it's very loose on the front end of things. Uh, and this is where I, I said there's a lot of stuff that's really in flux yet. So I, th I think we'll see this change quite a bit still. If I double click on the counter component, there is a placeholder, a to-do, if you will, of counter.razor that says uh, this is for um, a workaround until map razor components supports additional assemblies. So the routing is kind of wonky right now. Yeah, that's a technical term, wonky. Uh, so I, I don't need that anymore as of what? Don't need that anymore. It's already fixed. Uh, so if I delete this, it's still going to work okay? I would have to probably add additional assemblies in here as well, right? And I'm trying to think, where do you add didn't get updated in the template, but it's already fixed. Um, where is additional assemblies? It would be, okay, so it is, it's importing additional assemblies from client imports. That's interesting, they chose imports. Um, I think it just grabs the assembly name. You can really put anything in there, but it chose imports and it's gonna grab assembly and then an uh, it add additional assemblies in program CS. Is it under map razor components? Or is it under add razor components? Add web assembly a comp components? Uh, I don't see it there. There it is, add additional assemblies. So apparently you have to add it there as well. So we'll look at that in a minute. We'll look at what we have, and then we'll look at uh, what, what we need to fix it. Uh, so currently we do have a counter in the pages folder just to set up routing, and then it points down to the client assembly. So this is, uh, like we were saying here in chat, um, it's fixed, but this is the template you're gonna get today. So we'll leave that as is for a moment while we explore. And we'll come back and delete this out and see if we can fix it. So um, you can see here as well, uh, there's a couple new methods that get called in to pull the components into the application. Um, it's interesting that we've got the app, um, the router, which calls additional assemblies already. And we may have to specify that again. 
Um, I may have missed that part of the release blog post. It's quite the large blog post and I didn't quite read it all. I TLDR'd it. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'll, I'll make a note to look there. Thank you, Smeb. Um, so again, we have our app and our routes, um, and this all looks the same as just the server project. What's going to be different here is, well, home is rendered on the server and there's no interactivity. So it, it just stays here on the server. Um, counter again, points to the, the client and weather is still streamer stream rendering rendering. Um, what I didn't see is a, um, an option to generate a controller and serve up, um, uh, HTTP requests. So that's not included in the template yet. Uh, so we don't quite have that either. So for the, the current time, uh, and again, these things may change. The weather forecast is only rendering data from the server side and doing stream rendering. Um, there's no uh, client side HTTP um, fetch example in, uh, in the samples yet. So that will be interesting to see how that's added in here. Um, if they do like a minimal API controller or something like that. Hey, Scott, uh, this is the Blazor Power Hour. So this is where, where you're going to see some Blazor. Uh, this is the cutting edge stuff today. We're looking at .NET 8, the new .NET 8 templates, um, and uh, kind of exploring some of the new options that are there. <clears throat> so uh, this is the client template, which... The only client aspect of it is the counter component. And uh, what was that, uh, Smab? They've been asked to keep the template cleaner. And there's lots of examples now. But yeah, what, what I'm kind of curious about here is uh, if I have a component... I, I guess Dan mentioned it would be done with a service and, and that makes sense. But um, if I have a component that is doing HTTP um, and I've rendered it from the server and now I want to do it on the client, like what do we do for auto render mode um, for uh, HTTP requests? Everybody's ahead of me on this. You guys are really on top of your new .NET stuff. Um, yeah, we were just mentioning that the counter.razor doesn't belong there anymore. And uh, we were going to look at how you actually weed that out. So um, the, the true Blazor fans are here today. Let's see. Let's close all these tabs out. Uh, we we kind of get the gist here. We've got a counter component on the client side. Um, and then... Apparently we can just delete this one. Uh, we never actually ran it to see if it works first. So let's do that. Let's run it and see if it works. Now let's take a look and see what we get. Uh, looks exactly the same. Uh, this time the counter. Ooh, there was a little bit of a lag there for some reason. I don't know if that was just my machine or what that was, but I, I was having an issue clicking on that. Let's try that one more time. So counter component, okay wonder if it was um, the, uh, the server rendered content and then it was waiting for WebAssembly to get loaded up in the background before it became interactive. Because there, there definitely was kind of a, a hitch there. So uh, the... Again, the, the weather component's rendering on the server, counter component's rendering on the client. If we look and see what we've got in uh, the network, we should be able to see some of this actually happening. Uh, we don't want the debugger. Thank you very much. Um, so there's uh, the Blazor Web JS. Uh, there's .NET JS. We've got... 
Uh, we've got a WebSocket connection again. Uh, let's see if it's actually, it's still transferring messages. Again, I assume this is going to be disabled in the next version. Um, I don't think we'll see that WebSocket running on uh, WebAssembly pages. Um, let's see. Do I not have all data? Okay, I do have all data here. I'm not seeing our, our WASM files coming across. Why is that? Am I missing the WebAssembly files? Where is that at? Oh, it's cached and you'll see. Well, that I emptied the cache. And then I need to reload again to see it. That makes sense. I'm uh, still not seeing it though. So the the initial load would have been um, well, it's not run. It's not on auto mode right now either. I thought that only happened on auto mode. It's already cached. Interesting. Then let's, oh, whoop. I want to make sure I have that open network. There we go. There's all the junk. Thank you, folks. There we go. There's all of our .NET stuff. So there's our WebAssembly coming down the wire. Everything's separated out too this time. We've got all the different libraries as .wasm here. All right. So that works, uh, these parts work the same. Counter is pulling in WebAssembly to make that work. And then we can, um, we can remove the counter component from pages here. Uh, again, that had a note on it that said that it was going to be implemented at a later date. Apparently the, um, the uh, template didn't make the update, but the code did. So we can do it ourselves. We can say add additional assemblies in here. And then uh, we need to point to the client app. So be Blazor, app one, client. Um, so this is what I find interesting. It's already in routes. I guess uh, the server has to serve it statically, so it has to be put in two places. I mean, it's already in additional assemblies. Why, why the two registrations? Um, and then we, we probably could just do any class in the... Um, in the tree of that application because it's going to grab the assembly property off of it so we should be able to get it from anywhere so let's see if that did it let's see if that does the trick oh 404 nope that didn't do it uh so you have to directly go to the pages dot counter no that didn't work either that did not work either Try rerunning that one more time just for now. It's not finding that route. 
So map additional components, add additional assemblies. There's the counter, grab its assembly. Is that not in here? Oh, okay. So that wasn't even in here because you would have got like a, there's two pages with that route error. Gotcha. So they didn't even add that in yet. So now it should pick it up. There we go. Um, there was that delay again. You can feel the um, WebAssembly being loaded in the background. That's so interesting. If you hit that button fast enough. Um, yeah, that would be one way to alleviate that is to set render mode to auto. Because um, you, can, you can sense it if you're fast enough. See, it's already cached. So I shouldn't be able to do it. No, I did it again. I don't know if you can hear me clicking on mic, but I, I hammered that thing about a dozen times and um, it's still loading WebAssembly in the background. So um, that interactivity isn't there yet, even though I can click on the button. So um, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, there's another framework. I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's a JavaScript framework out there that comes with some like fancy loading animations and transitions and stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, we talked about it on Eat Sleep Code last week. Uh, but it'd be neat to see if they added something like that in there where it, there's some kind of loader uh, for those type of scenarios. Um, let's take a look now at file new project again. This time, uh, when we build this out, we're going to use uh, the WebAssembly components and server pages components. See if there's any actual difference here. So let's go ahead and, and do that. Um, I did this earlier and I failed to see a difference. Now we've got render mode auto here. Is that the only difference between the two? So this was render mode WebAssembly last time. Now it's got render mode auto because I guess we have both client and server. Um, yeah, that is a good point. It is in debug mode. It's probably waiting for the debugger to attach in addition to um, up, uh, downloading the extra resources. Okay, there's some program CS changes here as well. Um, yeah, so it'd be on the server probably. So there's going to be, um, in addition to add WebAssembly render mode, you're going to have server render mode, uh, server components and WebAssembly components. It's both there. So this has everything. This would be, I guess, uh, like, uh, somebody mentioned, I think it was SMAB. So like, this is the default way to go anyway. Um, because the real, like, um, uh, benefit here is this auto render mode like this is where things get really nice you get all of the speed of blazer server side and then um, the ability to offload uh, to the client with blazer WebAssembly, and it does it automatically based on whether the WebAssembly resources are there or not right so, um, we again have this counter component that can be deleted. We can take that out of there and then go back and add the, uh, additional assemblies here again. And essentially we have the best of everything. Dang it, I think we can hit anything off of that assembly and it's going to work. So that, um, and then uh, we need the route at the top. And now we're going to go with auto render mode. And what this is going to do is the first time 
we visit the counter component. Um, small delay there again. Small delay still. Uh, it should be a web assembly, or I mean, it should be a Blazor server. Um, let's do, let's take out the cache again. And then tab over to network, reload this page. Everything comes in. We're, um, everything came in immediately. It's a little bit hard to see maybe uh, on a local um, thing. Let's try. So this should be auto render mode. Let's do a little device throttling here and see fast 3G maybe. Go back over to the app, clear the site data out, and then uh, back to the network tab and reload everything and see, um, so we have no interactivity, no interactivity. I thought we'd get some Blazor server in there. Still loading resources in and it's laggy. That's, I, well, I guess because the Blazor server is why it's laggy. So, um, I mean, not because it's Blazor server, but I'm throttling it and it's Blazor server. But you can see it's still loading the .NET, web, um, .NET runtime on WebAssembly still in the background, but I'm able to interact because we have WebSockets. Yeah, not DLLs anymore. We've got uh, .wasm and there's, isn't there another file extension that they're using um, for some resources too? I'm trying to find it. I don't see it in here. I see .wasm everywhere. That should help with people's firewall issues that they were having. So now everything is loaded in. Um, and did it automatically transition to WebAssembly? I thought you had to reload the page for it to go over to WebAssembly. Because it's it's actually working without any lag at all now. Um, maybe just the simulation of the Fast 3G was um, with the other resources downloading was enough to give it a little more delay on Blazor server. Uh, we should be able to see the WebSocket here. If we go under here and messages, and I don't think the WebSocket is transmitting data anymore. Did it, does it automatically switch over as soon as WebAssembly loads? I thought you had to reload the page to get the true like WebAssembly behavior out of it. Let's see what's under network again. Now that I've reloaded the page, I've got yeah nothing. Yeah, the WebSocket will definitely get closed automatically in the next release, but I thought you had to reload the page to switch from one render mode to the other. That's what I did. Um, but what was strange was the first time it loaded, it looked like it automatically stopped using the WebSocket connection. Because you could see the data, um, at least on a, maybe on the counter, you should be able to see something in here. It'll look kind of like this versus empty. These empty, these are just keep alives, I think. Uh, let's try this one more time. We're going to go clear site data, uh, switch back here, reload. So it's loading in the WebAssembly stuff now. Oop, I'm getting a debugger. Um, oh, it loaded it too fast. Let's try a slow 3G connection. We'll do empty cache, hard reload. Let it come in super slow. And then I want, hasn't loaded in yet. I want to look at the WebSocket connection. Oh, sorry about that. I could try to zoom in on it. Uh, we've got, there we go. There's the connection. Um, 
it's not letting me zoom in on the, the dev tools, unfortunately. Oh, there it goes. I was wondering if it was going to let me do that. So still downloading WebAssembly. If I click, okay, I'm not getting any interactivity on the counter. Oh, there it goes. One, very slow. Very slow. Uh, it is, you know, slow 3G, so it is throttling. Okay, so this is not showing any traffic in the WebSocket connection. That's weird. What I thought I would see is uh, these counter clicks going through. I believe I'm looking in the right place. Is there another? That is the WebSocket connection, is it not? Um, yeah, it could be browser link, but I don't. Yeah, that's the browser link one. That that explains it. There's that's the one I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. That was browser link, Smab. Um, so yeah, now you can see the messages flowing through. That's why it was odd last time. And then once once I revisit the page, um, you might see a keep alive here, but you won't see the interactivity bits like that. So if I reload again, now that has all the, the resources cached. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure I find the right one again. Oh, it's, is it downloading stuff again? Um, I don't see the WebSocket at all. So yeah, that's how Blazor works with, um, oh, there's the WebSocket. So that actually won't be there at all next time. Uh, strange, it's still there. Still there and still sending and receiving messages. Let's uh, turn throttling off, try reloading one more time. Okay, I don't, I don't see it this time. And then if I, I hovered over it last time, that's browser link. That's also browser link. So there, there's two browser link web sockets. Use a WebSocket filter. Yeah, I could. Uh, what's the proper name? Oh, well, we get the point. The point was one uses uh, it, it switches modes. I thought it was doing it in real time. That would be that'd be hard. Um, the underscore blazer is the web socket. So this is auto render. It can switch between the two render modes. It can switch between the two render modes. And um, it does it without you having to really do a whole lot. The difficult piece is going to be um, when you have HTTP requests inside of a, a component um, that's using auto render mode and uh, also state management. Uh, so those are some things that we're going to need to to make some considerations around when we're building with auto render mode is, is how to swap services and things um, to either get data from the service or from a server or from a HTTP request uh, based on where it's running. 
yeah, these are somewhat standard issues. But uh, for example, I've got a weather forecast component. It's always rendering from the server. Uh, the counter component, if I wanted to do some sort of HTTP request on, um, you know, maybe when I click the button, it's going out to the server and doing some work, not just counting. Um, how do I handle that versus, um, just running something directly on the server? So, um, you know, mixing these concepts together, I think is going to be, um, something I, I haven't looked at yet but uh, I need to see how it's, it's actually done. So I, I realize like we could set up dependency injection on each one of these and inject a service. Is it going to pull in? It's gonna pull it in through um, through that dependency injection. So let's see, we could, let's experiment with it for a minute. So if I wanted to take this weather forecast, and make this an auto, um, Yeah, so if I wanted to auto render it, I'd actually take it out of the server app and move it to pages. And then on pages, let's delete that. Uh, we would change this to auto render mode. Uh, then I would take this out uh, we don't have a shared anymore, so that's that's not a thing. Uh, so add new. Uh, well, we don't really need to go all in, do we? We can just take the server references the client already. We can just take weather forecast and chuck that into add new item. We can just throw it in there right now. Oh, you got it in your <laughs> store. If you just, if you have it ready to clone, I can take a look at it. If it's up on GitHub, just throw the link in there. Uh, give me a second. It's, I gotta find a way to get this out of my uh, console here. To save me some typing, looks like um, Scott has an example I can use. So we'll just go to start window here and do clone repo and hit clone, don't save. And then, is this just the, the simple stuff here? It is, look at that. Thank you, Scott, saving me some time, keeping us within that hour. Uh, let's see, so what you did here is you have the, all of the components are now on the client and we were looking at weather so you have the iWeather service. Um, iWeather service is uh, coming from this class libraries interfaces folder. It's a nice example. I like it. Uh, you get everything. Um, you can leave stream rendering on, ma'am. Where's dark mode? Uh, dark mode is hard on my eyes for some reason. I can't use it. Um, 
when I use dark mode, I can tell the eye strain is different because um, when I get off of my computer, it's hard for me to focus on anything that's not at a screen's distance. So I stopped using it. It, it just strains my eyes out. Uh, right, and then we've got our weather forecast model. Uh, we've got a H oh, you put your services in the class library as well. So you didn't bundle them inside of the uh, client or server. And then um, you've got the iWeather service for the server. You're even caching. Look at that. It's nice. Um, so you're using uh, cache here in addition to make it even faster. So uh, you've got the HTTP version of it as well. And then in program CS, I would imagine we've got the uh, add singleton iWeather service of weather service. And then on the client, we should see the HTTP client version of iWeather service with HTTP client weather service. And this is how I set up my um, uh, Blazor hybrid projects, the same, same idea. And uh, this would probably allow us to add Blazor Hybrid as well. Oh, singleton, singleton should have been scoped. Yeah, it, I think it's okay with something like weather service, right? But if you have something that um, is going to vary from client to client, like you're going to leak data between the clients, which is not good. So that's, that's the one thing that you need to watch. Like if this was state, you definitely, you definitely want to do it, uh, scoped, right? You don't want a singleton instance of app state. I think weather service would be okay without any, you know, as is. Cause it's not taking any parameters or anything custom to that, that view. It'd be, it'd be all right, but uh, the problem comes when you start adding things to it and forget that it's scoped or singleton. I mean, uh, so long, long time ago when we first launched uh, Teller QI for Blazor, right? We did this by accident. Uh, it was like the first day I think we launched. If you go to demos.telleric.com. So we first launched this page, right? Um, let's see. Do we change the navigation? No, I need to click on something. All right. So the first day we launched the page, I'm sitting in here looking at a demo and um, I, I navigate and I realize like this is changing to the wrong pages because the state was scoped or singleton is <laughs> the service for the navigation over here was a singleton. And if there was somebody else visiting the site, you would get this randomly changing to the wrong page on you versus keeping um, the right breadcrumbs. It was really weird. Like, uh, see how they stay open. Like these, these would just randomly open and close on me. So I immediately got back with the team and was like, yeah, I think we, I think we set up our, our uh, service instance wrong. Uh, the lifetime scope is uh, a singleton, not, not scoped. And like people are sharing state on the, the breadcrumbs. And sure enough, like we had to fix that. So it happens. It happens to the best of us. So there we go. And there's our weather controller. And uh, we're using the weather service there on the weather controller. It was a much more efficient use of resources. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was very weird. There was like a ghost navigating uh, the page with me. So that's it for the new uh, templates. Uh, I guess the one thing we didn't try is, uh, do we get just static rendering?
if we do Blazor web app and don't choose anything, no interactive components at all. And there's uh, no client in this one. We've got components, pages. They didn't even bother adding the uh, counter component. So there's no counter component in this one because we can't count. So yeah, we get no interactivity with this, this version. Uh, so this would be like uh, an MVC app without any JavaScript, right? So we can render things out. Uh, we can do uh, classic form postbacks. Um, this would be good for like blogging, stuff like that, right? Uh, great for SEO. Really great for SEO. Uh, extremely fast load times. Agree with that. So this is very, very nice. Like it. We've got uh, everything to just render an app here in one of the easiest component models I've ever seen. Uh, if you need interactivity, you can later sprinkle that in, but if you don't need it, it's a very fast and efficient way to just render HTML. So we've got that ability now. So th there's a lot, um, a lot to take in here with these new project templates. Um, one thing I need to look at, uh, let's go back. Um, maybe on another show. I think we'll get into it another day. I'm going to go ahead and try to finish up the work I already have on the Blazing Pizza app. Maybe we'll look at, and I want to try to do this before .88 ships in case I need to submit a pull request. See if I can get a pull request in. Um, I don't know if they've had time to revamp some of this stuff. But uh, no, it doesn't look like it. There was some weird things inside of the CSS for these templates, and it doesn't look like they've taken any um, time to fix it yet. So there's, like, this is really, uh, maybe where multiple people have worked on the project and had different opinions on how CSS should be written. So in some instances, you will see um, classes being written with CSS. Some places you'll see Bootstrap being used. Uh, there's some places where, like, I don't know if this is the page or not, but you see, uh, like, this PX, which is, like, uh, padding on the x-axis is set to 4. And then you'll dive into top row. And then in top row, you will see... Um, yeah, like I said, I don't know if this is the ag exact instance I'm thinking of, but it would be on something like this where top row is here and then there's padding being subtracted from, <laughs> from that, that initial padding to override it. Um, yeah, so, um, the, there were people like fighting with the with bootstrap so either use bootstrap don't use bootstrap but don't use bootstrap and then use um additional css to like fight the bootstrap like either choose one or the other and they're they're kind of doing both in this this is it right here here it is top row article padding left and right important um if we go back to main layout, if we look at article, the only reason that they need to do that important is they're, they're fighting with the padding that somebody set through Bootstrap. So they just drop this side by side. Um, I did go in at one point and rewrote this whole thing and I lost it somewhere. I was on the plane, I was bored. Uh, so I was on a flight, I was looking for something to tinker with, and I rewrote the entire, the entire CSS code. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Magoo. I didn't know you're lurking there. Um, but yeah, like this, this is one of the, one of the instances I saw and it, it was very striking. Like 
it's just, I think it's a matter of two different people working on the project, to be honest. So uh, what, what I've, you've got is, this is essentially saying the padding should be f whatever four is in Bootstrap. And then somebody coming behind it and going, yeah, I don't like the padding. Let's go ahead and make it this. And then it's not working for some reason. So I'm just going to go ahead and jam important on there and F anybody else that comes behind me and tries to ever set the padding again, because now it's set to important. And uh, yeah, you're really not going to be able to do anything with it. So um, I we might take this on uh, Blazor Power Hour or something and try to rewrite uh, some of the code here because yeah, it does this. It does this and it's, I know it's just the boilerplate, but you know, it should be better. It could be better. And it's probably one of those evolutionary things. Somebody wrote this with bootstrap and then somebody else came through and added some stuff to it and was like, this is the way I think it should look. Let's, let's change it. So, yeah, that's the way it ended up. <laughs> yeah, you don't even have to do that anymore, right? You can do, uh, let's, we didn't even look at that, but file new project, Blazor web app. Uh, you can turn on all the great features and then turn off the include sample pages, hit create. And now I've got a Blazor app with um, just a home page and a layout page and no CSS whatsoever. So that's what I would probably do myself. But um, yeah, if you want to put the starter content in there, it should at least not fight with itself. If it's going to use Bootstrap, it should just use Bootstrap and not all that weird stuff that tug of wars with padding. So we'll we'll do that next week. We'll we'll jump in next week, see if we can fix that and submit a pull request, and maybe we'll make it into the the final release before the end of uh, November. All right, folks, that's the new templates. All right, so you've got the WebAssembly template, uh, you've got the server template, you've got the auto render template, and then you can toggle off all of the placeholder content. Um, and then uh, Scott put a, a really nice version of the template in that has the um, uh, different services. If you didn't catch that link, it was scroll up and chat. Um, that lets you toggle between um, Blazor server and Blazor client services uh, using fetch or HTTP client, whatever you want to call it, HTTP client and uh, just pulling data off a server and using dependency injection to swap between the two. Good stuff. Um, let's do a little raid here. Let's do, let's see, did I close my Twitch console? I did. I did. Let me get my Twitch console back up. And we'll see who's streaming. And then uh, I'm going to try to push a pull request up to um, the Blazing Pizza repo. And then next week we'll, we'll pick apart the CSS for, um, for this. Uh, that's where things might get super opinionated because I've, I've got opinions when it comes to CSS. Auto render mode can lead to running server and WebAssembly in the page at the same time. Oops. There be grown pains. I'm sure they'll get this squished by the next release. So that's, uh, did you post a link to your example in here is it is it linked to the issue i definitely want to take a look at that um there it is subscribe
Oh, okay. Gotcha. Take care, all.